Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending where you are in Canada. Um, my name is Ken Coates. I'm a Monk Senior Fellow at McDonald Lurie Institute, uh, responsible for our program in Indigenous uh, Indigenous Canadian policy. Um, I'm joined here today by my colleagues uh, Chris Sankey and Melissa Merbecki. Um, we're talking today about what real reconciliation can look like. Um, this is an important day for Canada. This is the first National Day of uh, Reconciliation. Um, the first time ever in Canadian history we've taken a day and made it into a national holiday uh, designed to sort of focus on the injustices and the mistreatment of Indigenous people over the last 175 plus years. Um, it is an important time for Canadians to reflect and this contribution, this conversation today is, is the effort of McDonald Lurie Institute to be part of that, that important, important conversation. Um, anybody who thinks that reconciliation is done because we have a national day is wrong. It is a starting point, not an end point. I'm joined here today by my two colleagues. Uh, Melissa Merbecki is a policy analyst uh, working now with the McDonald Lurie Institute. Previously has really interesting history of working on land and governance and oil and gas issues in, in her own, uh, in, in, in Alberta. And she's from the Muskokan, uh, Muskokan First Nation. Uh, Melissa, great to have you with us today. Um, and my other colleague, uh, Chris Sankey. Uh, Chris is from Northwest of British Columbia, um, a Shimshan, uh, coming to us today from, uh, from Prince Rupert, BC. Um, Well-known Indigenous entrepreneur, uh, working on uh, an endless number of projects. Chris is always uh, like the energizer bunny of Indigenous re-empowerment uh, through economic development. And we um, love very much his uh, activist and and the determined participation um, in the sort of the abetterment of the lives of Indigenous people. So Chris and, and Melissa, wonderful having you with us today. And just so everybody knows, our format today is we'll be with you for about 40 minutes uh, altogether. Um, and it's a conversation between the, the three of us. I get to ask the questions and Melissa and Chris get to give us their insights and ideas on how to proceed. And um, so I'm going to ask each of you to address the, 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 the big question in the very first instance. And it's the question of what real reconciliation looks like. Uh, clearly, the conversation has been out there. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission gave us the language around the need for reconciliation. Uh, they were the ones that recommended the National Day of Reconciliation. You know, the, the, so we have the word, we have the concept, but the focus uh, for all of us has always been on the what works on the ground. What can we actually do that will bring about meaningful and sustainable reconciliation? So Melissa, I'm going to uh, jump on, on with you first and ask you to sort of address that question. What, what, what do we need to have real and sustainable reconciliation in Canada? I think one of the first things that we can look at is awareness. Um, and we're definitely getting that today on this uh, national holiday. And I think the awareness and education, um, you know, will flow naturally, you know, between person to person. But where it doesn't flow um, is in our education systems. And I think this needs to be addressed. You know, more students, more people need to have an understanding of what residential schools really were. So I think that's a really big step in reconciliation. The other one that I see on the ground, um, you know, is bringing services to First Nations communities and ensuring that, you know, when we do have action plans that they are implemented. You know, we cannot keep going and giving us these, you know, we can't keep going on promises. You know, you promise X amount of dollars, but really what do you get out of it? So I think what we need to do in the future is that we need to have a timeline on action plans and we also need to have implement implementation dates. We need to be able to tell communities within a year, within three years, you're going to see this happening. And currently we don't have that structured in our systems and we need to start having accountability on all levels. So I think these steps, I mean, they seem very small and insignificant, but you know, they would make huge impacts in First Nations communities, especially with timelines and you know, getting substantial action in communities and that's what I want to see going forward and this is what this is what true reconciliation would be to me. Great thanks Melissa and, and just an interesting context that sort of reinforces what you've said um, we have the federal government has passed Bill C-15 which is the the uh, the UNDRIP legislation United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and I always describe the Bill C-15 as a promise to make promises 
it actually doesn't say very much except that Canada will reconcile its laws and policies with, with UNDRIP. But we'll, over the next couple of years, we'll produce an action plan, um, and that action plan should be much more detailed. And, and interesting, the BC government has put a draft action plan out for circulation. These are very complicated documents. Your point is, you know, don't just make promises, actually have a strategy for implementing those promises, money, real money attached to them, and a schedule that people can be held accountable for. I like that very, very much. Uh, Chris, your, your thoughts on what real reconciliation looks like? Well, I mean, today is a very good start on on recognizing the, our, our shared history. I think that Canadians uh, are starting to uh, come to grips of the reality of what's happened to us in the past. Uh, I've always said, you know, together we're stronger, and, and the way we're going to do that is be able to acknowledge the, the truth. And once we start to acknowledge the truth in our country, that we could find a path forward by working together. And I think, <clears throat> I mean, Melissa hit right on the button. I, I think that one of the areas that are, is still lacking, even though there's been significant work done, is our education system. Uh, and I'm starting to see it now. I actually just the other day, my, my young daughters came home and they were talking about residential schools. Uh, and it's actually quite, it, it made them sad because I, as a parent, I've not talked to them about that. And it's kind of indicative uh, from when my parents, uh, you know, when they've had to, to go through that whole process of residential school, they never talked to me about it. And I found I was doing the same pattern uh, of not talking to my kids about it. But I'm really happy to hear that uh, the schools are there because it was actually my daughters with one simple conversation in the school system. Uh, they're able to to actually know and understand what happened to us. So I think first and foremost is just acknowledging uh, the truth. And that's how we're going to move forward. Uh, action, uh, action speaks louder than words. I think that the I hope the government is listening loud and clear now and they understand that we, we can no longer just talk about it. Uh, for me, uh, enough of the social uh, uh, back padding. Um, you know, we, we need action and we need to move forward. And as you know, Ken, I, I'm, I'm very focused on economic reconciliation. And as I believe that in order for our communities to move forward, it's, it, it's one thing to work with the governments and, and get these grant funds, which I'm not against, but uh, I think the real focus needs to be about generating sole source revenues through economic development in the resource sector. Uh, and, and you know, I'm, I'm very outspoken about that. If we could continue uh, down that path where we start to own, control these opportunities, we could see significant benefits back to our communities where we could generate sole source revenues, where we could start to take care of our elders, where we could start taking care of our, our, our own healthcare system, our own social and well-being, our welfare system, and, and providing these jobs and training and, and academia for our younger generation. Um, I, I'm going to be speaking sometime in June on on women uh, uh, getting involved in the energy sector. And I was very blessed to get an invite to speak on, on that conference coming up in June. And it's about how do we get more women uh, involved in, in these executive roles? Uh, and so I always say economic reconciliation, where it's really, where we're gonna really see the, the differences. It's nice that we're starting now, and I'm really happy in the direction we're headed. But it's the head start our, of our younger generation at the head start for the three to five year olds over the next 20 years, you're going to see Canada in a whole different light because of those future leaders. That's a really good point. You know, I, I always use the, the sort of relative numbers that in the 1970s, early 1970s, the number of Indigenous students in Canada's colleges and universities numbered in the several hundreds. There were very few Indigenous people at colleges and universities anywhere <clears throat> now the number is actually over 30,000 you know and 30,000 indigenous students going year after year after year really adds up to a transformative sort of uh, population so so mm -hmm. melissa just to put chris's question back to you in a bit different way what's what right now is standing in the way of economic reconciliation what what are the techniques or or barriers that have to be addressed in order to sort of give indigenous people a chance to participate in the Canadian economy and to share prosperity in a meaningful way. Right now, uh, what I'm seeing are a lot of the bills that are implemented. You know, you, you have a bill like under Bill C-15, for example, which is meant for the well-being of First Nations people and communities. But at the same time, it's also 
not recognizing the voices on both sides of the conversation. So you may have some communities that are pro natural resource and development and pipelines, and then you may have some that aren't. You know, both sides of the equation, um, you know, the voices need to be heard. You can't just hear one voice and make your decision um, from that one loud voice. There are community members that aren't being heard. And I think what this bill does is it, it kind of divides communities, you know, and that wasn't its intention. The intention of it was to bring future and further well-being to these communities. And that meant, you know, economic development, then each community has a right to choose how they want to sustain and build this um, and build their communities up. So whether a community is fishing, whether they're, um, you know, looking at logging, they have a right to do this, you know, as long as they're taking all the considerations, environmental concerns, they're taking all of that into consideration and making a decision based off that. Well, that voice matters. And sometimes I find some of these bills, they shut certain people out. Another bill that, you know, we can look at nationally is Bill C-69. You know, after most of these projects, they take years, if not decades, to come to a decision and for the consultation to happen. It takes years to bring communities and people on board. What this bill can do is it can come and stop that project right there. And that is not fair to future projects. And that's not fair to existing projects that have been canceled. So it's bills like these that put, you know, a lot of it, hard work basically in the garbage, you know, and we deserve a lot better. Canadians deserve a lot better. And we need to start coming to the table federally, provincially, and from a reserve level so that we can come to, you know, we can come to an agreement on these issues. Until that happens, you know, we're going to continue to see stalls, projects stopped, projects canceled. So we need to start looking at this today and we need to start coming up with solutions. Well, thanks, Melissa. It's interesting. A, a recent study was done about asking Indigenous people in Canada about whether they supported resource development that was properly done, by which they mean consultations and appropriate compensation and, and returns to the Indigenous communities and the survey showed that 65 percent of indigenous people were in favor of properly done resource development that flies very much in the face of what sort of the, the popular imagination might be that indigenous people are unilaterally opposed to resource development some are most aren't and and in fact if you do it properly with full, with full participation you get some really interesting developments taking place so chris the same question to you you know when you say you you want to have uh, own source revenues, you want the communities to be economically self-sufficient, what's standing in the way? And what, what in terms of the local public governments and the non-Aboriginal population, do we need to do to make sure that prosperity is available to Indigenous people on their terms? Well, I mean, the, the, the bills itself, is it, it can be extremely um, um, confusing on one hand, we're saying we the bill UNDRIP is supposed to help us become self-sufficient, self-determination, so we could uh, look after ourselves in our own backyard. And then you got, on the other hand, uh, I find that the bill is picking and choosing of what should be supported and what shouldn't be supported. And that, as Melissa uh, stated, that's not what its intention was. Uh, if you take a look, for example, and I'm really sad to say this, but when you take a look at what's going on in the Pachida, uh, the, the, the judge just ruled that the, the RCMP uh, was arresting people unconstitutionally. And yet uh, you don't see it in mainstream media, but these protesters are actually getting super violent. And now I feel, I, I feel absolutely, uh, I feel so bad for that nation of what's happening there. And uh, the, the government, and I'll, I'll keep saying this, um, the government needs to start stepping in along with you know, working with the nations to change the policy around NGO funded organizations. Uh, I don't think it's right that um, we, 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 we fight for 150 years to get to where we're at today and we're still fighting for that right. And then you have that happen and you have these protests right across the, the country. 
and this narrative out there is somehow that all indigenous people are against resource development that is simply not true and so when you go to these places and i and i i really wish our people would start seeing this for what it is they they put a number of indigenous people out front so the camera could see them but the real organization and an organizers behind the scene are all non-indigenous people and they're going to these GoFundMe pages and they're raising this capital with the um, narrative that somehow all of us are against this development. It's somehow we gotta, we gotta, they gotta save us. So let's stop prosperity for our communities. That is not true. And we need to put a stop to this. Like I, I, the damage that this is creating, the opportunity for us right now to move forward with own, we own these things. We could own these mega projects. We could be partnering with our other nations. But the narrative that I keep watching is that you got some of the government officials saying we need to start having indigenous led discussions and opportunity. And then you got other ministers yelling, we got to stop because the sky is falling. We can't do fossil fuels. We can't do gas. We can't do this. And the only time I find they want to work with specific nations or our nations in general is if the, the, the topic of discussion suits the narrative of what the agenda is. Oil and gas are not going anywhere. And the opportunity to look at hydrogen, I don't know enough about it. I'm learning more about it. But the opportunity for First Nations to take control of whether it's oil, gas, fish, forestry is now. And, and I believe these organizations uh, with, I think they, they started off with good intentions, but now it's gone so far to one side that the people that are getting lost in these opportunities that are the ones that are going to suffer the most is our people. And we fought so long and so hard to finally come to the table and really have meaningful ownership only to watch what's unfolding in this country. It's actually very sad. So we got to change that. We need to change it now because more and more people uh, in our communities are, they're the ones paying the price. Thanks, Chris. Um, that's really an interesting perspective from both of you. And and for those of you that aren't familiar, what Chris was talking about is a conflict over Ferry, Ferry Creek, which is an old growth forest development being done on, on the in the middle middle part of the of Vancouver Island. And the odd situation there is that if you look at particularly the international media, it's being presented as a indigenous people against logging. If you look at it more locally, the indigenous people are working with government and the companies quite closely, and they're they're actually being shunted. To the side and it's their economic development that's being held up and so the kind of conflict you're talking about really reflects a long-standing pattern and that is is that you know non-indigenous people use indigenous people for their purposes so when it suits you know that we're going to protect this on behalf of indigenous folks well as you point out and most of points out indigenous communities have their own sort of value system um let me talk a, a different different tact and on a different different aspect of reconciliation when you look at almost any study that's been done, uh, the boil watery advisories, which is a big issue for Melissa, and she's written about it very extensively, housing, uh, roads on reserves, fire protection on reserves, these communities are way, way below the national standard. You know, some of the communities have their own money and they've invested very well and they've, they're doing better, but many of them are in really difficult circumstances. Um, do you think Canadians are prepared to spend the several hundred billion dollars necessary uh, to bring indigenous communities up, not to great heights, but simply to the national standard in terms of the basic infrastructure and basic facilities? Melissa, what are your thoughts on that? How, how eager and how willing are Canadians in the spirit of reconciliation to do what is the most fundamental element, and that is to guarantee indigenous people the same quality of services that the rest of the country takes for granted? I think when Canadians look at the infrastructure on reserves, many are quite surprised at how um, how below um, you know the national average they are. When people have to boil their water, boil their water, sorry, and they're living under advisories for decades as opposed to days, this is this is concerning. Um, and I think what they're starting to realize is that. You know, if we don't address this today, we're going to have bigger issues down the road. You know, what's going to happen in five years from now? What's going to happen in 10 years from now? A simple fix to a water filtration system, a, a plant, 
you know, something that that could be fixed today and within a month, for example, you know, if, if it goes un, unchanged for a year, that's going to cause the whole system to collapse. So we might have had a fix that costed $5,000. A year from now, that same fix could be $60,000. You know, so we have to start thinking of what's cost effective. We have to start thinking of, you know, this is impacting people's health. You know, if this is something that regular Canadians take for granted every day. You get to go to your tap and drink clean water, cook and clean. There are communities that are only allowed a, lit a liter and a half of water every day. You know, that, that's, that's the amount of water that we should be drinking. But they have to ration that for cleaning. Um, they have to ration it for cooking. They have to ration that water. And that's, if this was, if, this was happening in a third world country, you know, there would be an outcry. There, th why is this happening? We're not living in a third world country. We're living in a developed nation where water is abundant. So this should not be happening today. And when we look at issues like housing that have mold in them, you know, how many years before that house is condemned, you know? So we need to start addressing issues before First Nations people become homeless. And we don't want to see that happening. You know, we've seen communities that had to get evacuated. How much did that cost taxpayers, you know, as opposed to fixing the problem? So we have to start thinking long term and we have to start fixing things today before they turn into bigger issues down the road. And I think Canadians are starting to see that. And, you know, we're starting to see a lot more advocacy out there for basic infrastructure. We're not even talking about nice to haves we're just talking about basic standards of living and it's actually quite sad what we're what we're experiencing and what people in our communities are living in i well i could not agree more and i think it's it's a stunning sort of reality these are not things that we've discovered yesterday we've known about the infrastructure deficits for decades and we haven't done much about it so chris to you you know, how ready do you think the governments are, federal, provincial, territorial governments, and the Canadian public in, overall, are, are they prepared to pay the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that, that all just to provide basic service? This is not an act of generosity. In, in Canada, you know, all communities aspire to the same level of public services and infrastructure, except for Indigenous communities. So, Chris, how, how ready are Canadians to do this? Or is this re are we really at a turning point in reconciliation? I believe we are. I, I think that more and more Canadians are starting to understand the struggles and challenges we've had for, for decades. Um, I'll give you a really good example. I mean, I, a couple of things first. Like I, 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 um, when we were negotiating uh, Pacific Northwest LNG, uh, for decades, the community that I come from, La Hula Lambs, uh, we've been wanting a road and a bridge to connect to Prince Rupert for so long. And it's been talked about, I mean, since I was a, a, a young boy at, from ages five and up. But they, they, the governments have told us if if it goes, we'd be prepared to pay X amount of dollars for critical infrastructure to get to and from our community. Now, when you talk to uh, countries that we were dealing with, they were quite shocked with that basic fundamental need to get to and from the hospital, proper Wi-Fi, proper road access, emergency response in case of an accident or death. It, it is so expensive to get into our communities because you got to use a helicopter if there's an emergency, but we can't even drive out. And the fact that we had to wait to see whether or not a multi-billion dollar project was going to go in order for the governments to fund critical infrastructure made no sense to even the people we were working with uh, on a global scale. It's a fundamental right that every community should have clean drinking water, critical infrastructure, uh, to feel safe in their own backyard, and we still don't have that. Uh, now, some communities are blessed. You could drive in and out. Ours, unfortunately, we cannot. We have to drive onto a ferry, then go across a 35 to 40 minute way before. We didn't even have that, but we had to go across. We have to go across in a ferry. Then you got to drive another 20 minutes in. And even then, we don't have critical infrastructure for Wi-Fi or fiber optic. So I think uh, in the last couple of, uh, of terms, I think the government has missed a real opportunity uh, for building critical infrastructure. Now, with that said, I hope that they start to realize now in order for us to be connected with all of Canada, 
critical infrastructure is one of the most important uh, things we need. If we want to look at major development in our country, infrastructure is what's lacking. So it's 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 such a key part and an integral part to connecting us with the rest of Canada from everything from the power grid, from fiber optic to bridges, roads, railways. All of that stuff is crucial for the prosperity for all Canadians, let alone our own communities. I love your comments from both of you. And it's interesting. Um, when people ask me, they sort of say, well, what do you think the government's policy should be in terms of, of uh, infrastructure and all these areas you've listed, fire protection, you know, um, internet, road access, all that kind of stuff. I say, you don't, need, you don't need multiple policies. You need a single policy. And the single policy is that within a fixed period of time, and let's pick a number of 10 years to be somewhat realistic, you know, all Indigenous communities in Canada will be operating basically at approximately the national average. In terms of all the core standard infrastructure, you know, there'll be exceptions of, you know, somebody who lives on a remote island and you, you can't build a bridge that goes for five miles. You know, if you're that far away, you have to have a ferry or you have to use boats. But we can be realistic about that. And, and that would be a policy. And you could actually then actually assess it and evaluate it and look at community by community. But let's say if we went into your community right now, um, how, how far below the national average would you describe your community as being in terms of core infrastructure? Well, the good thing, the difference between me and Chris's community is that you can access mine. So we have a highway that goes to my reserve. So getting access uh, to the community is a non-issue. What is an issue are the services that are offered to my community. You know, we have to drive 45 minutes to the nearest hospital. If there is an emergency, you know, uh, people have to get airlifted in. We, uh, the hospital that we had nearby was closed or shut down or turned into a senior's home. So we don't have, we don't have the services for our people. We do have a couple nurses that come out to our community, but we don't have a fixed, um, you know, fixed healthcare system. So everything is done in a remote way. So doctors visit us every so often, nurses come in every so often, um, you know, and this was beneficial during COVID. So, you know, there's always a workaround that we have to find to get services to us, which is unfortunate because, you know, we should have hospitals within at least 20 minutes for people. And we're not seeing that. Um, you know, housing is really big. You know, we've had a housing shortage for since I was a baby. You know, there was never enough homes for people. And there was always overcrowding. There was always multifamily homes that really should be single homes. Um, you know, we had poorly built homes that eventually caught on fire. You know, so there's a lot of um, I'm going to say a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of building long-term sustainable homes and infrastructure for our people. Now we did get Wi-Fi not that long ago, so we are connected to the outside world. Um, you know, so there's, I mean, we have a lot to do, but we are fortunate with what we have. And this is the ideology of most communities out there. We're just happy with what we have, even if it's below par. And in terms of infrastructure, I'm going to have to say we're definitely below the national average. Um, I would probably say, you know, we're even in the minus at this point because not everybody has a home and we're using trailers to house people, trailers, like not, not mobile, no, not mobile trailers. I'm talking about the trailers you see out in remote camps. Like that's what we're using for housing. So we definitely need improvement on that. Thanks, Melissa. And I, one of the things I always find fascinating when we talk about these ideas, we forget that Canada is one of the wealthiest nations, not just in the world, but in the history of the world. You know, there's a, a recent report just came out that essentially said that Canada was the number one country in the world. And, and you know, they look at about 15 or 16 different categories, everything from education and healthcare and democracy and all that sort of stuff. And there we are right up at the top. And depending on how you count, you know, obviously Norway, Sweden and Finland, Denmark, often come off in, the, in really high Sw Switzerland as well. But, you know, Canada's rarely outside the top five or six. And our major cities are, are constantly rated as being in, in, the, in the top 20 major cities in the world for Toronto, Vancouver, and, and, and Calgary, Montreal. We do really well as a nation. 
And for some reason, we have this roadblock in our minds about saying, well, for Indigenous communities, you can't do better. And I've had the really good fortune of spending a fair bit of time in northern Norway, Sweden, and Finland in the isolated communities, not in Oslo and Helsinki and places like that, but actually you know, way up north in, the, in these isolated locations that are several hundred kilometers from a major city. They have paved roads. They have high, and had five years ago high quality Wi-Fi. They have fresh water. They have doctors and nurses living in the towns. All these things are are uh, uh, we can address them. We can deal with them fairly fairly systematically. Let me ask a question, if you don't mind, in a, in a very different way. And this is not to take anything at all away from the residential school issue, which is obviously what got the country's attention. And, and we got the attention to Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Really tragically, we got attention this summer with the, the sort of the dis conversation and discussion about the unmarked graves. For some reason, that really got the attention of non-Indigenous people sort of in their hearts for the first time. I think all the other discussions, they were conceptual. It sort of worked in people's brains. But this last summer really seemed to move Canadians in other sorts of ways. But my, my question to you is, is, is it all residential schools or are there other historic flaws in, in our country that have contributed to the marginalization of Indigenous people and the poverty and the suffering that sort of goes with that? You know, what, 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 else, what else is there? And I'll tell you, I asked the question because I worry that, that people sort of focus on residential schools and think, well, we're going to address that issue for that group of survivors. And we're not looking at the other broader issues, which actually had an effect on many more people. So, Chris, this time I'll go to you first, if you don't mind. Um, you know, so are there other issues out there, other problems, other policies, other questions that we should be sort of factoring into this discussion about reconciliation? Yeah, I mean, it's it, you hit it. It's policy and legislation. Uh, but we're really going to change the way we do things in this country. Policy and legislation has got to change for us as well. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it, it's no secret that, you know, if we can't even vote for our national chief, but the elected chief of our respected communities can. I could vote for the prime minister of Canada, but I can't vote for our national chief. Uh, so that determines, so about 650 leaders determine who's going to be our national chief. I mean, I don't, that's not democracy. I mean, it's just crazy. And the fact that they came up with that, that system is just, it's nonsense. But anyways, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I mean, look, um, uh, we got to move forward. And the only way we can move forward is if government starts kind of, you know, getting out of the way and start working with us and supporting us in our initiatives. I keep going back to economic reconciliation because that's going to solve so many of these issues that we're talking about today. Uh, it, what, what this pandemic has really showed me is that uh, how quick money could get thrown or pushed out the door to get things done. So when someone tells me that it can't be done or if you're going to use a pandemic for a reason to get it done, that's nonsense. If you could get money out the door this quick, you could get money out the door just as quick to get inf critical infrastructure for our communities to correct us with the rest or to connect us with the rest of Canada. There is no excuses for that. If, if anything that I've learned from this we, is to know that we could do this thing in a timely manner. And that not only helps our communities, but it helps broader Canada. I mean, there's this, there's this challenge out there of what, how do we, how could we do this? Well, give us, you know, we have the tools to do it. We just need the support uh, to go forward with it. The money is there. Big business wants to invest. We have an opportunity to move these things. We just need to get out of our own way and have government support us. You know, And at the same time, uh, we also got to take responsibility in the matter and really be more aggressive about what it is that we want to see. And I always tell our communities that we got to we got to be more aggressive about ownership in this stuff and really look at sole source revenues and go back and use your own capital and start buying back our own fee simple land. Don't wait for the government. I'm not saying not don't work with them, but don't wait for that. If you got the capital, my advice to so many of the indigenous communities, go out and buy back all your fee simple land, even if it means putting it back into your territory. Because right now Canada is losing land mass to build and the only uh, lands coming available is indigenous land. Yeah. Fascinating conversation, uh, you two. You're always so insightful and so passionate about the both the, you know, well, the, some of the frustrations, but I'm so impressed with the fact that you never let 
the, the weight of history gets you down. Um, you're both so optimistic about the fact that Indigenous communities are ready to take control of their future. So I'm going to ask you a blunt question, and Melissa, I'll start with you and then finish with you, Chris. Um, you know, 10 years from now, uh, in 2031, uh, will reconciliation have happened? Um, if you look at where we are right now in 2021, we're making all these commitments to reconciliation. Melissa, in the next 10 years, how much do you realistically think will be done? So I have two answers for this. Um, my first answer is if we continue going down the same path that we are today, reconciliation is not going to happen. You know, we need change. We need to change the way our federal and provincial governments connect with us. We need to change, you know, even our internal governance system within our reserves. We need to look at what, what hasn't worked in the past and what could work going forward. Once we start implementing even small changes um, in any government, you know, we'll start to see progress because right now what's happening is we're not hearing each other. You know, we, we, we all have our stance and each person, each entity is not moving. So how do you ever expect us to get for, move forward? You know, so unless we start looking at concrete action plans and implementing some of them, you know, many First Nations communities, we're not asking for grandiose changes. You know, start with the small stuff and, and, and move on to the bigger items or start with a handful of communities, see how that works out and then push it out into others. You know, there are options, you know, but the option to stay where we are and to continue the way we are is not an option if we're going to move to reconciliation. You know, we need to start seeing change. We need to start listening to different voices. And we need to start looking at some of the tangible things that we can do today on and off reserve. Melissa, so Chris, give the last sort of thoughts to you, if you don't mind. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, Melissa just gave us a wonderful list of sort of the kind of steps that can be taken, small steps, big steps changes in values, changes in approaches, is it going to happen? Well, look, <laughs> in 30 years from now, uh, Ken, I'll be almost 80 years old. And if my kids are still having this conversation, we've failed miserably. <clears throat> but look, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, I have to be. I'm hopeful that uh, reconciliation and, and where we're going to be at in 30 years is going to be a whole different world for my children and children's children. I really believe that that the generation coming up is going to be the ones that are going to make uh, and make sure that uh, we no longer um, fall between the cracks. I really believe that, Ken. I really believe that you're going to see a whole different Canada where there's more Indigenous uh, control, uh, ownership and involvement from every aspect, from education to the social well-being, to our culture, our language. I really believe you're going to see way more of our people speaking our language fluently in this country, um, just as they do in Southeast Asia or anywhere else that speaks a whole different language than, than English. I, I really believe that. But like I said, if we're having this conversation and 30 years from now, we have failed miserably as a nation. So we need to pull up our boots and just get to work. Um, let's, let's put words into action. No, enough talk. Let's just move forward and get the job done now. Well, thank you, you two. You're so very insightful and so passionate about what you see forward. I certainly agree completely with what you what you had to say. Um, you know, and, and we, we have to move forward. There's no question. You know, if, when we when we don't move forward, all of the costs fall on the indigenous communities. So if we don't build the roads, if we don't build improve the housing, if we don't improve the water supply, the non-indigenous population suffers a little bit indirectly but the overwhelming cost actually falls on Indigenous people. So quite frankly, the message is it's all on all of us, right? It's an, a collective responsibility for Canadians to do what has to be done uh, to make things better. When I listen to the two of you, I, I see such, such wonderful passion, but I see a couple of other things. I see real hope. Um, that, and, you, and your hope is not grounded in sort of some fancy idea of what might happen. It's grounded in the fact that you've seen change. From my point of view, I've, I've seen change. The Yukon, where I grew up, is not, a, not the same place at all as it was in the 1960s. Indigenous people are very prominent in governance. They're very prominent in economic affairs. They're very prominent in social affairs. The cultures are, are, are getting stronger and more resilient. It's, it's great to see. Um, I've also seen what happened in places like Scandinavia and New Zealand, where 
the communities discover when you empower indigenous people, the whole country benefits. It's not just indigenous communities that get better off and healthier, uh, have, have fewer of the social challenges that we see, but actually the benefits circulate through the population sort of as a whole. So with you, you, you give us hope, you give us a sense of optimism. Um, you also are very realistic in the sense that I love Melissa's comments always. You always come back on this, Melissa. Start small, you know, get, get an action plan, put some boots on it, make a commitment to do something, and then be held accountable for that. Like don't, not, no more big words, no more big symbolic gestures. We've got the symbolism out of the way. So it seems to me that today, if I was to describe it, today is the last day of symbolism and the first day of action. We've got the symbols. We've got the National Day of Reconciliation. Symbols are done. Let's get on with it. Let's do something. Let's make the country a better place. And let's do that by making Indigenous communities stronger, more powerful, more autonomous, build through economic reconciliation, political empowerment. Let's make a better Canada. Uh, you two are just fabulous. Thank you very much for being with us today. We're going to do this again very shortly. Uh, on behalf of the McDonald Lurie Institute, I'm, I'm Ken Coates, a Monk Senior Fellow with the McDonald Lurie Institute. I'm delighted to have Chris Sankey and Melissa Mabarki with us today. I'm recognizing and honoring this National Day of Reconciliation. And like I say, the last day of symbolism, the first day of action. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you. you.